Hello students, welcome back to another video. In today's video, we'll do paper 4, course code 0625, May, June 2024, variant 1. First question is saying, a long tube contains oil. A small ball is held at rest at the surface of the oil. At time t equals to 0, the ball is released and begins to fall vertically through the oil. Figure 1.1 shows the ball falling through the oil. So here we have a tube in which we have oil and there is ball which is going vertically down. As the ball begin to fall through the oil, it accelerates. Firstly, define acceleration. So acceleration is increase or decrease in velocity and we calculate it by calculating increase or decrease per unit time. So it is change in velocity per unit time. B part says the mass, ball has the mass 0.075 kg. Calculate the resultant force acting on the ball when it accelerates at 2.8 meter per second square. So we have to get resultant force. We have acceleration and mass. So it would be equals to F equals to M times acceleration. Mass is 0.0075 and acceleration is 2.8. So resultant force would be 0.021 Newton. C path says as the ball falls, it, its speed is recorded and the speed time graph for the falling ball is made. On y-axis we have velocity, on x-axis we have time in seconds. Part 1 says describe what happens to the acceleration between time t equals to 0 to time 0.040. And explain why it happens so for time 0 to till 0 0.03 the graph is like a curve and if we see our velocity time graphs it is very much similar to this last graph the curve is very much similar to it see it is going in the same pattern and for these type of curves we have velocity decreasing non-uniformly and acceleration is also decreasing so for the first graph, first curve, we have a decreasing acceleration. And for this straight line, this is very much similar to first graph. For this, the velocity is constant and acceleration is zero. So we can say here we have zero acceleration. Now we have to give reasons for it. Why acceleration is decreasing and why it's zero. So if the ball is going down under the effect of some resultant force, so if it would be represented by F and there would be a resistance uh, that would be offered by this oil that would be represented by R. So this resistance of oil is causing the velocity of the ball to decrease, hence causing the acceleration to decrease. Also, after 0.03 seconds, this downward resultant force and the resistance become equal to each other and the velocity reaches a constant value and the acceleration is zero. So downward and upward forces are equal and the constant velocity is known as terminal velocity. So I'm writing the reason from 0 second to 0 0.03 seconds the ball deaccelerated due to the resistance. After 0 0.03 resistance and the resultant force become equal to each other and the ball attain a constant or a terminal velocity. Question number 2 is saying by drawing a tangent on figure 1.2 determine the value for the acceleration of the ball at time 0 0.010 seconds. So we are supposed to draw a tangent at this point. And after drawing the tangent, we are supposed to find the acceleration by calculating the gradient of the line. So I'm taking two random points on the line and I've, I have to write the coordinates of it. So for the coordinates, I need to know the value of one box. For x-axis, it is 0 0.01. And for y-axis, the value of one box is 0 0.02. So for this point, the coordinates are 0 0.025 and 0 0.06 and for this point the coordinates are 0 and 0 0.022 i am naming these coordinates as x1 y1 and other as x2 y2 the formula for the gradient is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 y2 is 0 0.06 y1 is 0 0.2022 x2 is 0 0.025 minus 0 
Doing the calculation, it would be 0.038 over 0.025 and finally the gradient is 1.52. You can give any answer between 1.2 and 1.8. So I am writing my answer of two significant figures here. Question number 2 says figure 2.1 shows two identical trolleys P and Q held at rest on frictionless horizontal surface. A load is fixed to a trolley P. So there is a there is a compressed spring between P and Q. The trolleys are released as the spring expands. It pushes the trolley apart. The trolley Q moves to the right with the velocity 0 0.36. The mass of each trolley is 1.2 kg and the load is 1.5 kg and the spring has negligible mass. So here we have a spring. It is compressed and when it will be released, it will push the trolleys apart. This will go here and this will go here. The trolley Q has the mass of 1.2 kg and trolley P is also 1.2 kg but it has 1.5 kg of load as well so the combined weight of this trolley is 2.7 kg and the velocity of this trolley is unknown. For this trolley we have the mass of 1.2 kg and the velocity is 0.036 meter per second. Now we are supposed to calculate the velocity of this P trolley. I can use conservation of momentum. Momentum of left trolley is equals to momentum of right trolley. Momentum is mass times velocity. So for this trolley the momentum is 2.7 times x and for this side the momentum is 1.5 times 0.036 so the momentum is 0.054. So for the right side the momentum is 0 0.054 and for the left side the momentum is 2.7 times x and x is the velocity. To get the velocity I'll divide these two values so the speed is 0 0.16 meter per second. Second part says the kinetic energy of trolley Q when it moves at 0 0.36 meter per second. Kinetic energy is half mv squared. The mass of the trolley is already given which is 1.2 kg. And the velocity is 0 0.36 squared, so the kinetic energy would be 0 0.078 joules. B part says, stay the energy transfer that take place as the spring expands. So there was elastic energy stored in the spring when it was compressed. And when it expands, it converts its energy into kinetic energy of the trolleys. So elastic energy stored in spring is converted into kinetic energy of trolleys. Question number 3 says figure 3.1 shows a small block of ice floating on warm water state one way in which the motion of particles of ice differ from the motion of particles of water. As you know that ice is a solid and the particles of solid are not free to move they can only vibrate. So I am writing not free to move and water is a liquid. So the particles are free to move. So this is the difference that particles of ice can only vibrate but particles of water move throughout the liquid. B part says energy is transferred from water to the block of ice. State the name of thermal process that transfer energy from water to the ice. So this is a bit kind of zoomed picture in which the particles of the liquid cannot go into the particles of ice but they can pass on their vibrations and passing on vibration is known as conduction. So I am writing conduction. Question number two says initially there is 0 0.34 kg of water in a beaker. The specific heat of water is 4200. Calculate the energy transfer from the, this water as the temperature decreases from 28 degrees centigrade to 10 degrees centigrade. So we have mass, we have specific heat, we need to calculate energy and we also have change in temperature. So the formula that suit here is, is the specific heat formula. Mass is 0 0.34, specific heat is 4200 and change in temperature is 18. So energy transferred is 2.6 into 10 raised to power 4 joules. Third part says the temperature of the water near the ice decreases first. Explain how convection caused the temperature of all the water in the beaker to decrease. How is this temperature going to spread? So firstly this ice is going to cool down the particles that are near it. After getting cooled down their density increases and as you know 
objects with higher density sinks down so these particle will go to the bottom of the beaker and uh, the particles that are present there that have less density will start to come to the top of the beaker and this will create a type of flow and a type of current which is known as convectional current so this is the answer to the question particles near ice cool down their density increases and they move down the particles of lesser density move up this creates a convection current and that spreads the temperature fourth question says state what happens to the internal energy of water as the temperature of the water decreases describe the change in terms of energy of particles so kinetic energy of particles is obviously reduced when the temperature falls so the internal energy also decreases fourth question says the lens in a magnifying glass is a converging lens figure 4.1 shows the lens of a magnifying glass it has two focal points f1 and f2 and its principal axis so here we have principal axis on which we have two focal points f1 and f2 first question is saying state what is meant by a focal point so focal point is a point where the line which is parallel to principal axis will go into the lens converge from the lens and meet at focal point so after converging from the lens the ray passes through the focal point so it is a point on principal axis a ray of light parallel to principal axis after passing through the lens meet second question says a student using a magnifying glass see a magnified image of the object mark point x on the principal axis for possible position of object and e for the possible position of i so when a converging lens act as a magnifying glass the object is between f and lens so i am going to place my object between f and lens so it would be probably somewhere between here and you can place i at anywhere opposite side of the lens let's suppose i am placing my eye over here third question says underline two words in the list that describe the image produced in a second part so i have already told you at this time our lens is acting as a magnifying glass the image producer is virtual that means the rays are not actually meeting they appear to meet it is enlarged you can see that image is greater than object and it is upright so going to the question back it's not inverted it's upright it's not real it's virtual yes it's upright and it's virtual b part says the refractive index of glass is 1.5 the speed of light in the air is 3 into 10 raised to power 8 calculate the speed of light in the glass so the definition of refractive index is that it is ratio of speed of light in the air divided by the speed of light in the medium of which the refractive index is given so for this case it's glass so it is speed of light in the glass i'm using this formula in place of refractive index i'll write 1.5 speed of light in air is 3 into 10 raised to power 8 and v is the speed of light in the glass I'll rearrange my formula with respect to V. Putting all these values into my calculator, the value is 2 into 10 raised to the power 8 meter per second. Second part says, state what happens to the wavelength of light as it passes into the lens. So the light has the greatest speed in air, then it has lesser speed in liquid and the least speed in solid. So the light is entering the glass, so its speed will reduce and due to the wave equation V equals to F lambda, as the light entering any medium don't change its frequency, so V is directly proportional to wavelength. If velocity decreases, wavelength decreases. If velocity increases, wavelength increases. So in this case, our velocity is decreasing, so due to this fact, our wavelength is also decreasing. C part says the converging lens are used in spectacles or to correct the problem with vision. State the name of the problem and explain how converging lens is used to correct it. You may use the diagram. So it is used to uh, cure the problem of long sightness. For example, we have this as an eye and this is retina and this is eyeball. So the light the coming parallel to the eye lens 
will converge and meet at the point that is behind the retina that means the person is not able to see the image because the image is not on the retina it's behind the retina so we will put a convex lens in front of eye now this convex lens will make the image exactly on the retina as you can see and the image is made on retina so the person is going to see the image clearly before the image was made over here that means the focal length was very long this lens shortened the focal length and made the image on the retina so i am writing that convex lens shorten the focal length and make image on the retina so the person can see nearby objects question number five says describe how longitudinal wave different from a transverse wave so longitudinal waves the particles vibrate parallel to the direction of the wave and in transverse wave the particles vibrate or move in perpendicular to the direction of motion of wave and also uh, sound is an example of longitudinal waves that needs medium to travel and light is the example of transversal wave that do not need medium so i'm writing longitudinal wave need medium to travel transversal wave do not need medium longitudinal wave molecule travel parallel to wave motion and in transversal wave the molecule travel perpendicular to the wave motion b part says figure 5.1 represent a seismic wave produced by earthquake so here we have a seismic wave and you can see clearly it's a longitudinal wave state whether seismic wave is p wave or s wave justify your choice so p waves and s waves are uh, basically two types of earthquake waves s is transversal and p is longitudinal so the wave that is given have compressions and refraction so it's surely a longitudinal wave so it's a p wave second part says the wave represents represented in figure 5.1 has wavelength of 1.2 into 10 is to power 4 meter calculate the actual distance between point j and k so in longitudinal wave the wavelength is distance between two consecutive compression or two consecutive refractions so here we have a compression here we have a compression so the distance between these two compression is wavelength which is 1.2 into 10 is to power 4 and again the distance between two consecutive compressions is 1.4 into 1.2 into 10 is to power 4 so here we have a one complete wavelength and then we have a half wavelength so so the distance between k and j is one and a half wavelength so i am multiplying 1.2 into 10 raised to power 4 with 1.5 it's giving me 1.8 into 10 raised to power 4 meter third part says the wave in figure 2 travels through the ground at the speed of 4600 meters per second as the wave passes a certain point the ground completes five oscillations Calculate the time that it takes for the wave to pass. Show your working. So we are provided with speed and there are five oscillations and we are supposed to calculate the time for five oscillations or five waves. So it would be very easy if we calculate the time for one single vibration or one wave, which is actually uh, named as time period and it is represented by T. And you know we can calculate the t and the formula is t is reciprocal of frequency so t is equals to 1 over f if we get our t we'll multiply it by 5 and we'll get the time for 5 waves so how can i get f now we have velocity and we have wavelength which is 1.2 into 10 raised to power 4 meter so i'll use my wave equation to get f it would be v over wavelength so 4600 divided by 1.2 into 10 raised to power 4 so the frequency is 0 0.383 hertz so i'll take reciprocal of it and i'll get the time for one wave to travel which is time period so uh, the time period is 2.610 seconds so this is the time for one wave to travel for the time for five wave would be this value multiplied by five which is 13.05 seconds final answer thanks for watching the video if it was helpful please hit the like button and subscribe my channel